Hi, I'm Annie Heater. Welcome back to In The Zone, our podcast series from the Middle East Treaty Organization, MATO, talking about eradicating weapons of mass destruction from the region. Remember, this goal is possible. It's only a matter of political will, something today's guest knows only too well. I'm Paul, and with Anna Heater, we'll be talking with Tariq Ralph, former head of verification and security policy at the International Atomic Energy Agency. When there, he was responsible for the Director General's report on the Middle East Zone and on experience from other nuclear weapons uh, free zones relevant to the Middle East. Tariq has been an insider for many years. He's also a a very sharp critic of many of the uh, nuclear weapon states and uh, is very active within the Middle East Treaty Organization's network. But let me hand over to you first, Anahita, for the first question. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think the first thing I'm really interested to ask is what first triggered and developed your passion to actually get involved in this field and work on this issue? Well, thank you, Anahita and Paul. I'm uh, happy to take part in this uh, discussion with the Middle East Treaty Organization. I've long been interested in the issue of nuclear arms control and disarmament, and also with regard to not only South Asia, but also the Middle East. When I was working at the Canadian Center for Arms Control and Disarmament in Ottawa, uh, this was an independent center funded by the Canadian Foreign Ministry. And I remember commissioning one of the first monographs in the mid-1980s, bringing together an Israeli expert, Avner Cohen, who later on wrote the definitive book on the history of the Israeli nuclear weapons program, and from the Egyptian side, Ambassador Mahmoud Karim, who was a senior ambassador, later a deputy foreign minister of Egypt. And these two contributed chapters on the Middle East uh, nuclear weapon free zone and, and resolving the, the conflict there. So as part of my professional work, I continued to focus on the Middle East. And as luck would have it, have it as uh, Paul just mentioned, when I joined the IAEA in 2002, uh, one of the first tasks that was given to me by the Director General was to write his reports, uh, uh, the report of the Director General on the application of IAEA safeguards in the Middle East, and also to implement the decision of the IAEA General Conference of 2000 to convene a forum of the states of the region, uh, bringing representatives from the other nuclear weapon free zones to learn from their experience how their zones came about, how the negotiations were carried out, and what are the prohibitions and what are the allowed activities. Thanks very much, Tariq. Um, one of the questions that often comes up uh, for me uh, is. Um, What are the benefits that could arise broadly to the region if there was progress to moving towards a WMD free zone? It's it's a region often characterized by lots of conflict. And and people often say to me, well, weapons of mass destruction are not the most relevant issue within the Middle East. What's what's your response to that? Well, actually, weapons of mass destruction, unfortunately, are very relevant in the region of the Middle East. We know that we have had the use of chemical weapons going back to the Iran-Iraq war. And now it's been substantiated that chemical weapons were used in in Syria. Uh, There was also an earlier incident of use of chemical weapons in Ethiopia. And uh, several um, countries of the Middle East have been um, detected by the IAEA in engaging in undeclared nuclear activities Related to the possible development of nuclear weapons, this is Iraq, Libya, uh, currently Iran is still under uh, discussion. There's talk out of Saudi Arabia of developing nuclear weapons. Egypt has talked about leaving the non-proliferation treaty and developing nuclear weapons. And all of them have focused on Israel as the only country in that region that has an undeclared nuclear weapon program. Um, Several of the advanced industrial countries, including some of the nuclear weapon states, those that are depositories of the non-proliferation treaty, are known to have uh, provided assistance to Israel one way or another in developing its nuclear weapons. And it is a matter of record that the U.S. administration decided um, not to talk openly about a possible Israeli nuclear test in the South Atlantic in the fall of 1979, and when the U.S. sent inspectors to uh, the Demona nuclear facility, um, it's also now a matter of record that they were clearly fooled 
and they were not shown the several levels below ground where uh, the Israelis were working on separating plutonium and nuclear warhead design and so on. We also know that in the 67 war, Israel had activated its nuclear weapons to use them, was the uh, security of the state to, uh, threatened. So it is an open, open secret. Uh, Israel's official policy is that they neither deny nor confirm. They also say at times they will not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons. Uh, but a couple of their prime ministers have made unguarded statements at times, which indirectly have uh, admitted that Israel has nuclear weapons. So if we were to have a zone free of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction, we would ban biological and toxin weapons, which are banned under the 1972 convention. We would outlaw chemical weapons, which are banned under the 1993 chemical weapons convention. So all Arab countries have signed on to the NPT. So Israel is the only country in the region of the Middle East that is not a party to the non-proliferation treaty and has not renounced nuclear weapons. So many of these states, especially within the MENA region, the status of their nuclear arsenal isn't necessarily confirmed. They have their own incentives, political, military-wise, even sometimes economic and social. What are some of the ways that you believe means to maybe limit this incentive and attraction that these states do have to continue to kind of avoid this issue and stop themselves from committing to progressive work towards building a constructive peace that doesn't involve nuclear weapons? Yes. So this is what I sort of found when I was working with the states of the Middle East region in the in, in developing the agenda for this IEA forum. Um, and uh, the, the positions of the two sides are poles apart. The entry point of the Arab states is that if Israel gives up and renounces nuclear weapons, joins the, joins the non-proliferation treaty, that will result in peace and security for Israel. And uh, it will eliminate any perceived need that Israel has. The Israeli position is the exact opposite. That they say, well, we want, first of all, to be recognized by all states in the region. We want to see a period of sustained peace. And once we have seen a period of sustained peace in which Israel feels secure, then Israel says we, we can give up nuclear weapons then. So these two positions are irreconcilable. Uh, and during the time after the postponement of the 2012 conference on the Middle East zone that was promised uh, by the states in meeting in 2010 at the NPT review conference, as you know, we had the Finnish Under Secretary of State, Ambassador Yako Laeva, who carried out these informal uh, discussions in Geneva on uh, having this conference. Uh, so for the, from the Israelis, they also want to discuss confidence and security building measures, as well as regional security. The Arab states refer to the resolution from the 1995 NPT Review and Extension Conference, which only talks about uh, a zone free of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery. So during these multilateral consul consultations carried out in 2013 and 14, uh, by Ambassador Yakolaev of Finland involving the Arab states. Uh, uh, Iran attended some meetings, but not all. The Israelis attended some meetings, um, as did the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and, and the Russian Federation, who were the sponsors of this uh, resolution. The Arab states were willing to discuss confidence-building measures and regional security in the multilateral consultations, but they were not prepared to discuss these issues in a formal conference on the Middle East. So it, it was partly on this issue as well as other reasons that this uh, dialogue uh, broke up. And now given the turmoil in the Middle East domestically in, in a number of countries following the so-called Arab Spring and then the, the, the developments in, in Syria and then the continuing situation in Iraq as well as in Lebanon, and then charges of uh, Iranian uh, uh, activities there, and then the further deterioration of relations between uh, the Saudi, between Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the one hand, and Qatar and Iran on the other hand. On the Arab side, there is a lot of disunity. So at the moment, it's very difficult 
That is why I commend Mito, uh, because as a civil society initiative, it can provide a venue to bring together representatives from these countries to talk about these issues in a sort of an unofficial manner and sound out areas where they could make progress until the political situation improves and they can talk uh, more openly. That's uh, that's really interesting, Tariq. You refer to the role of civil society and particularly METO. Um, we, uh, you and I and Anahita and others have been meeting uh, over the last few years to develop the draft treaty text uh, and to consider some of the technical challenges there are to putting together a zone. What what would you say are the principal uh, obstacles, challenges and, and opportunities uh, when thinking about the technical dimensions of, of uh, putting together a zone? Well, at one level we can say that the technical impediments are not as serious as people have made them out to be. We can either complicate the situation or we can simplify it. I personally have long believed that if all the countries of the region of the Middle East uh, relevant for the zone uh, were to sign up to the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and fully abide by them, that in a sense provides the mechanisms and the modalities for taking nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons out of the equation. So we, from my point of view, do not need to reinvent the wheel and under the framework of a possible treaty, come up with new ways of getting these countries to eliminate these categories of weapons, because then we would have two parallel sets of commitments. One would be under the multilaterally negotiated treaties, the BTWC, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the NPT, and detract from their universality. And then we would have the Middle East zone uh, obligations where they agree as such. So from my point of view, that's the more simple way. The problematic area is means of delivery. And we have no agreed criteria or mechanism to define what are means of delivery for nuclear weapons. In the past, it was regarded it would be ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, as well as certain types of uh, piloted aircraft. But now we have uh, UAVs, unmanned um, armored vehicles, drones, and so on, that can also potentially deliver a small nuclear warhead. So this is a very challenging area. We have some uh, criteria we could look at, which come from the missile technology control regime, although that is not a universal regime. It is a regime created by certain participating countries, but nonetheless, we can look at some technical criteria there. But if the weapons themselves were to be prohibited, then the means of delivery are not that relevant. But if you don't have nuclear weapons, you don't have biological weapons, and you don't have chemical weapons to deliver, then, then these uh, delivery systems, while they may remain problematic, but not as problematic as they would be if the weapons themselves were not banned. Thank you, Tariq. That was really interesting. You mentioned about the challenges. And of course, that makes me think that, of course, on both the state level and with, amongst civil society and the reaction that you get from not only states that aren't necessarily as proactive in kind of engaging with this discourse, and also amongst individuals and societies, there can be a lot of cynicism when it comes to talking about establishing a WMD free zone, working towards global nuclear disarmament. Why do you think it is that people can be so cynical about the prospects of this? Yeah, unfortunately, I think over the past um, several years, the space for civil society discourse, I think, has been shrinking. In many Arab countries, you see the rise of different types of Islamic fundamentalism a very narrow, non-secular interpretation of Islam, going back to various interpretations of Islam from the seventh century of a type of Islam that never really existed. It only exists in the minds of these so-called mullahs uh, who to a large extent have been influenced by a particular worldview emanating primarily out of Saudi Arabia, which is very regressive. And also in Israel itself, uh, the space for the peace movement and dialogue with the Palestinians and making peace with the Arabs has also been shrinking. 
So when in civil society itself, those who would like to talk about these issues are marginalized or they don't have enough space or it's difficult for them to convene, it sort of further complicates the situation where the governments themselves are at loggerheads. And if uh, civil society, those that are well-meaning, are willing to take risks of possible imprisonment, of possibly being accused of traitors and, and supporting the enemy, but they are still so committed that they want it to work, it, they, even they are finding it very difficult. On the other hand, with new technologies like the one we are using now, Zoom and so on, it, it's possible to convene meetings without necessarily traveling and creating these communities of dialogue through setting up these chat groups or whatever the term is. So there is a way, I think, of uh, countering government censorship and government opposition and also the opposition of the so-called right wing or the fundamentalist parties and the, the religious uh, ideological uh, elements in Israel also are in the ascendant. It's not only in the Islamic world. Um, so I think there is space for civil society using modern means of communication to try and create more space and provide more content um, that other people can can reach and hopefully be influenced by it. And therefore, I think uh, the the website of Beto with its various documents and now these podcasts that Demito is doing, uh, I think provides certain resources for people to to listen to and hopefully uh, bring about a a better frame of mind. Tarek, the Biden administration has just uh, appointed a, a, a number of people to the uh, State Department, uh, and uh, it has every intention to rejoin the. JCPOA, the uh, Iran nuclear deal, uh, and uh, will be a different uh, emphasis to the previous administration. Um, what's your sense of the opportunities here or the limitations based on past experience? And um, how does its position on the JCPOA or could its position relate to the zone? So let me start first with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that was um agreed by the Obama administration, Iran, the three European countries, EU, China, and Russia, signed on the 14th of July in Vienna, uh, 2015. Um, at the moment, the positions of Iran and the Biden administration, again, unfortunately, are at odds. Uh, the Biden administration, Biden himself and Tony Blinken, his incoming Secretary of State and his National Security Advisor incoming Jake Sullivan in recent interviews, have all said that Iran must first reverse the seven steps that Iran has taken since summer of 2019, responding to the pullout of by the Trump administration from the JCPOA in May of 2018. And once Iran has reversed these steps, that is that it has uh, uh, gotten rid of the nearly 2,500 kilograms of enriched uranium that it has, as opposed to the 300 kilograms that it is allowed, uh, and also uh, come back within the operating limits for centrifuges. After that, uh, they would uh, talk to Iran, but also bring on the table ballistic missiles and regional issues. Uh, the Iranian position is the exact opposite. They say that since it was the U.S. that left the JCPOA, the U.S. must first uh, re-enter the JCPOA, remove all the sanctions, give financial compensation to Iran for the damages that Iran says it has suffered, and then they're willing to talk, and that ballistic missiles cannot be on the table. So these are, these are two very divergent uh, points. Also, um, with Iran continuing to enrich, and now they are enriching at 19.97%, and they recently announced that they would be converting some of this enriched uranium to metal form. From my point of view, actually, that is good because this is 19.97% uh, enriched uranium. If converted to metal, it's only useful for fuel. It cannot be put back in gas form to be re-enriched to 90% for, for weapons. So the two sides, the initial negotiating positions at the moment are very divergent. Hopefully, they can find ways of, of uh, coming uh, together. Um, on, on, on the broader issue of the... Biden administration and the Middle East. I wrote a few weeks ago an article 
called the Great Expectations, the Coming of the Messiah, in which I recall that unfortunately it was also the the Obama Biden team that uh, was responsible for the collapse of the 2015 NPT Review Conference on the issue of the Middle East. They were the ones who walked away from the 2012 Middle East Conference. Under Trump, the U.S. opposed the General, the General Assembly decision to hold the Middle East Conference under the aegis of the Secretary General, the first of which was held in November 2019. Um, so at the moment, I find it difficult to see where the Biden people are coming from on the issue of peace in the region of the Middle East and then the issue of the weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapon-free zone uh, in the Middle East, and also the issue of uh, the JCPOA and ballistic missiles. Um, and, you know, some of the policies of Saudi Arabia, the war in Yemen is, is very problematic. We now have uh, the rise of terrorism back again in Somalia, possibly Sudan. So the situation is sliding back again. And uh, for most people, they believe that the biggest challenge that Biden will be facing, first of all, is the COVID-19 pandemic, where more than 500,000 Americans have died. The, the U.S. economy is tanking. Uh, and so that will occupy them for the first 100 days or so. And these other issues, nuclear arms control, JCPOA, and the Middle East will slide further down. It also depends when all these officials can be confirmed uh, in, in their position. So they actually have uh, the negotiating leverage to talk to the Europeans, to the Iranians, and to others. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, it's always fascinating to talk to you. And uh, it, it is sometimes feels like um, taking a cold shower. Um, it's true. We have to control our expectations. Uh, this is not the Messiah that ca- that is coming into the White House, but at least he's not a very naughty boy. Just to wrap it up, I'd like to say thank you to Tariq for a really, really interesting discussion. I personally gained a lot from that. Um, Just a quick thank you to everyone listening today. Thank you for tuning in for another episode. Uh, To remind you, we upload those episodes by on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. We are also online. Our website is www.wmd-free.me, where you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money, and even volunteer to work with us. We also have our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, which are all under the username WMD3ME, where you can follow us, stay in tune with all of our updates and all the things that we've got in store for you for the next month and the year ahead.